Hello everyone and welcome back to Autonomy Talks. This is the first talk of the year and we are very happy to have with us uh, Professor Silvia Herbert, who is an assistant professor in mechanical and aerospace engineering at the University of California, San Diego, adding the Safe Autonomous Systems Lab. So something about her, uh, before uh, actually starting her, her professorship, she earned a Bachelor of Science and Master of Science from Drexel University in mechanical engineering. And she then moved to California, where she obtained her PhD in electrical engineering from UC Berkeley, uh, working with Professor Claire Tomling on safe and efficient control of autonomous systems. She is the recipient of many fellowships and awards that you can uh, you can see in uh, her bio. Uh, and today's talk will focus on the connections between Hamilton Jacobi reachability analysis and control barrier functions. And we are very happy and interested to hear what she's going to talk about. So Silvia, go ahead, the stage is yours. Thank you so much. And, and I have uh, all your faces over here. Uh, please feel free to interrupt me as I go. I'm gonna, this is a, a somewhat technical talk that I'm hoping to, to make not too, um, I don't know, not too much at once. So if uh, you have any clarifying questions or, or concerns, please uh, raise them as we're going. So yes, today I'd like to talk about the relationship between these two kind of subfields of doing safety analysis and control. And the motivation of me for, for doing this is that starting my job, I was given the opportunity to teach a special topics course. And I wanted to teach a course on, on safety for autonomous systems and wanted to teach on, on a few different methods. And these are two very popular methods right now. And so I was kind of forced to actually pay attention to the relationship between these methods so that I could teach them. And it, it actually turned into a, a very fun uh, research project where we looked at how we could kind of uh, combine uh, advantages from both of these methods. Um, I like to highlight my collaborators. So students, Jason Choi and Donggun Lee. A lot of these slides are actually from Jason Choi from our recent CDC talk. Donggun Lee is uh, currently on the faculty market. And this is in collaboration with Koshal Srinath, who's the kind of CBF expert, and Claire Tomlin, who's the kind of reachability-based expert. So the, the motivation for both of these subfields is to have a value function that provides safety uh, certificates and safe control. Uh, the main very, very high level goal is to take some desired safety constraint and the long-term effects of the dynamics and to turn that into a single scalar function where this scalar function is positive where it's safe and negative where it's unsafe. And if you look at a trajectory of the system moving around in the state space and look at how that trajectory evolves according to this you know, safety level, uh, you get informed two critical pieces of information. So depending on where you are, you can look at what's your current safety level. That's a measure of the safety margin. So when you are have positive safety, you are inside the safe set. And as you approach zero, you are approaching the boundary of the safe set. And the second thing is having a, a gradient that informs you of the, the direction that is safe or unsafe. So this is, this is the goal to have a function that provides this and that you can then use online to determine how safe are you currently and in what direction should you go into if you wanna recover more safety. So these are the, the two kind of very popular approaches that I see a lot in the literature right now. There's the Hamilton Jacobi reachability and control barrier functions. Both of these you know, use this core concept of just having the safety level, safety value function and using it online for um, uh, safety control. And we were curious to explore what's the relationship between these two methods and, and can we migrate theory and tools across these subfields? Because um, often they're developed in each subfield uh, independently without a whole lot of uh, connection between them. So the main goal of what we're trying to do here is just to bridge the gap between these two, understand the relationship between them. And what we ended up uh, doing is introducing uh, this kind of mishmash of the two called a robust control barrier value function that I will get into. So this is the, the overview of what I'd like to talk about. So first we're gonna go into Hamilton Jacobi reachability or safety control. And that breaks up into two components. First there's offline finding what that safety value function should be. And then online actually using that safety value for the safe control. Then we'll similarly talk about control barrier functions, introduce them and talk about finding the control barrier function and using the control barrier function. 
And then we'll get into this um, mishmash of the two, the control barrier value function and some discussion in future work. And again, please feel free to interrupt me if you have questions as we go. So let's start with Hamilton Jacoby reachability and how we find or construct a safety value function in reachability. So in HD reachability, this is the general form of, of the system that we assume. So we have some system that evolves based on its state, based on control inputs, and based on potentially disturbances. Usually we think of these as bounded controls and bounded disturbances, and we look at uh, worst case disturbance situations. There are also uh, several approaches that try to deal with stochastic based uh, uh, control and disturbance or um, risk averse uh, disturbance uh, uh, stuff we're thinking about like CVAR, for example. But for right now, let's start with the kind of vanilla uh, method, which is thinking about bounded control and bounded disturbance. And in reachability, uh, because we're just essentially doing brute force dynamic programming, it's very general in terms of what types of problems we can solve. So some examples are we call this uh, set versus tube. That's a set would be asking, what are the set of states such that in exactly two seconds, I will inevitably hit this tree. So uh, there's a certain point where I'm so close to this tree where even if I break and try to turn, if the wind is strong enough, it can knock me into this tree. And so this is the set of states where in two seconds exactly, I will be inside of this tree. The tube, which is something that we often care about in safety analysis is asking, what are the set of states where within two seconds, I will hit the tree. So not only where I will hit the tree at exactly two seconds, but sometime within which. So you see that it also encompasses the tree itself. If you start in collision, that counts as being in collision within the time frame. We also have avoid versus reach. Both of these I was talking about as, as avoid cases where the control is trying to uh, maintain higher safety levels and the disturbance is trying to do the opposite. Uh, so in both of these cases, that's, that's the situation, but you can also just flip the max and min where now the control is trying to reach that set and the disturbance is doing the opposite. So let's say the set of states from which I'm guaranteed to reach my house within two seconds or at two seconds, depending on your set or two. And we can also look at finite time and infinite time cases. So in finite time, all of these the situations that I was showing before are finite time asking within two seconds or at two seconds, what will be the, the situation. If we extend this to an infinite time horizon, then the case that we often have is that for avoid cases, typically this converges. And typically this converges because if you start off far enough away from this tree, even if the wind is really strong, typically you can do something to avoid hitting it. If this tree is where you all are in Switzerland, I can avoid hitting that tree from where I am in California. Now, of course, if the disturbance is strong enough that the wind could literally pick me up right now and carry me across the country and slam me into the tree, uh, then this wouldn't be the case. But often for practical situations, avoid uh, computations end up converging. Reach computations typically do not, unless they're bounded by a wall or something. So, if, you know, if I'm trying to visit you all at ETH Zurich, given enough time, this reachable set or reachable tube will eventually reach me in California and provide me with a way in which I can come visit you all. And finally, we also look at backwards versus forwards. So all these situations I was talking about are backwards cases where we're looking at the final destination and then working backwards in time. Uh, there's also forwards cases where we can look at where I initially start and asking where are all the places that I can reach within two seconds. And we can do combinations of these where we have reach and avoid and the same thing, where we have multiple obstacles where the goals and the avoid um, and the obstacles are moving with respect to each other. And we can do all of this because what we do in reachability analysis is just brute force dynamic programming. Um, and I'm gonna, about to give an example for that. Before I do that, are there any questions about the different types that we have here? Okay, we're gonna focus on this uh, infinite time safety case because this is the, the, uh, the focus of control barrier functions. And so we're gonna look at a subset of reachability analysis. 
where we're looking at uh, avoiding uh, some obstacle for uh, an infinite time horizon. So let's do a very simple example. Um, note this, this is not necessary to understand the higher level concept, but uh, I find that sometimes people enjoy kind of walking through a very, very simple toy example for how we do reachability analysis in the actual code. So let's look at an infinite time avoid backwards reachable set. Here, my dynamics are just super simple, just for illustration's sake. The change in position's velocity, change in velocity is, is acceleration. And I'm saying my acceleration is between minus one and one. And I have some obstacle that exists in position space between minus one and one. So this is what it looks like if I have position space here and velocity here. My obstacle exists in position space and it exists across all velocities. I don't want to hit this obstacle at any velocity. My flow field of the system looks like this, just kind of mapping the flow field here onto the actual uh, state space. The first thing that we do is define a terminal cost function. So here this function is uh, typically a sine distance function. And so you can think of this as a sort of distance to the obstacle. Um, here we have uh, that it's negative inside the obstacle and positive outside of the obstacle. So I, I suppose in this case, you can think of it more as a reward function. And we set this as our terminal value when our value is at the end of the time horizon. And we're going to work backwards in time to figure out what is the value function at the, the beginning of the time horizon, given that we want to maintain this reward. To compute this backwards reachable set, we use this particular formulation, which is called the hamilton jacobi isaacs partial differential equation, or I guess in this case, it's hamilton jacobi bellman because we're only looking at control. And it's essentially saying that the change in value over time, if I fix a particular point in my state space and look at the change in value over time, this is going to be based on this Hamiltonian, where the Hamiltonian is saying that I'm trying to uh, maximize along the gradients of this value function. So I'm trying to move up the slope as the control and move away from the obstacle. Uh, but subject to the fact that I need to obey my system dynamics, I need to obey this flow field that we see here. And so I look at the inner product between the flow field and the gradients of the system and maximize along that. So for this particular case, if we look at the gradients of, of this function, on the left-hand side, we have that dv dx is, is minus one, the slope, and dv in the velocity direction is zero. And it's the opposite on the right-hand side, right? The slope is, is one on this case and, and still zero here. So if I actually just plug in these numbers, then I have doing this full inner product, I have that my change in value backwards in time, thus the negative, is going to be the max over u of the inner product between those two here. I'm just going to go ahead and plug in dx dt, which is velocity, and the velocity dt, which is my input acceleration. And I have to maximize over the control here. So I'm going to go ahead and pull out the things that don't depend on control. So here I'm just maximizing over this. And I know in, in this particular case that my control is bounded between minus one and one. And so when this uh, gradient is positive, I'm going to pull out a one to try to maximize this. When the gradient's negative, I'm going to do the reverse. And so the result will be that I'll always pull out the absolute value of this gradient. And this, for this very specific uh, case, will be our, our update equation for the first time step. So if I look at a particular point in the state space, and think about how the value function will change backwards in time. It will be based on the current gradient in the x direction times the velocity, plus the absolute value of the gradient in the velocity direction. So how will this propagate in this particular case? Well, looking at the left side, case one, where we know our, our gradients, I'm just gonna plug those in. So plugging in dv dx here will give us a minus one, plugging in zero, or dv and d velocity will give us zero. So that's just saying that this backwards in time will be based on the negative current velocity. So if I look at my zero boundary right here, up here, where let's say my velocity is three, I'm currently on the zero level set of the value function. If I take this step backwards in time, then I'm going to go in the negative 
velocity direction of value. So this point that was at zero before will now be negative. This point over here that was also at zero before at negative three will now become positive because it will change by the negative of that velocity. Over here, case two, it's the opposite. We put in a one. So that means that this change is based on the current value of the velocity. And so we see that it moves in this direction. And this should in intuitively make sense. This means, you know, in, in one second, the set of states for which if I start in that set, I will end up inside this obstacle are everything that's inside of this blue, uh, blue set here. And you can see based on the flow field that moving forward in time, indeed, we should expect to see that. So there are states from which I am to the right of the obstacle, but moving with such a high negative velocity that I will inevitably hit the obstacle, even if I'm trying to decelerate. And also there are states here where if I start inside the obstacle, I'm able to, uh, to move outside of the obstacle by accelerating outside and vice versa up here. So if I go ahead and propagate this through for an infinite time horizon, this is what I end up seeing. So we saw that rotation that we expected, but then we also saw this lifting effect. And so thinking for a second about what's happening there, as it's rotating, again, this is saying the set of states that I will start in such that within exactly 0.85 seconds, I will be inside of the obstacle. And as I rotate, the gradients in the X direction get weaker. You see that as we rotate, eventually all the gradients will be in the velocity direction. And so these get stronger. And so over time, this becomes less of an effect. And instead we see that the value function lifts by the absolute value of the gradient. And so that's how we see this lifting effect. And this should, should also make sense intuitively. This is saying that eventually given enough time, there are no states from which you will be exactly inside of this obstacle at that exact time, because that's what a backwards reachable set is asking, not whether you will hit the obstacle in general, but whether you will hit the obstacle at exactly that time. And given infinite time, I can either, uh, oops, I can either um, power through the obstacle and end up on the other side, or I can break with enough time to avoid hitting the obstacle in the first place. So this can sometimes be, be useful to analyze, but often in the case of safety, we don't really care about hitting the obstacle at exactly a particular time. We care about whether or not you ever interacted with the obstacle. And so we wanna somehow be able to capture any trajectories that ever entered the obstacle. So to do that, recall this is what we were doing before. We're going to have the same equation as before, but we're gonna add in one more element. And that's going to be this minimization between the PDE that we were using just now and this term L minus V, where L is that terminal cost function, the green function, and V is our current value function. What this is saying is that the minimum between these two, the left-hand side and the right-hand side must equal zero. So each side must be greater than or equal to zero. And when this right-hand side is, uh, more minimal than the, the left-hand side, then we set that equal to zero. We set L minus V equals to zero. This means that we're setting V equal to L. So this is a little bit of a, a nuanced point. I'm going to, to say one more time, but this isn't a crucial part of this talk. So I'm not gonna harp too much on the intuition for this. But in other words, when the Hamiltonian is trying to push the value function into the obstacle, so it's trying to lift the value function above L of X, we force the function to be on the boundary of the obstacle. And the effect that you see is I think more intuitive than, than the math. So when we actually run this, this is what we see. So you see the same rotation effect that we had before, but we capture the value function as it's trying to move into the obstacle. So we never allow uh, points that had negative value, negative safety to recover uh, to have high safety again. And now this we can run until convergence. And this will tell us all the states for which within an infinite time horizon, you will eventually hit this obstacle. So if you start over here at a negative velocity, you will eventually end up hitting this obstacle despite uh, trying to break 
And similarly up here, if you start over to the left of the obstacle, the positive velocity you will eventually hit this obstacle. Okay, so that's my very, very simple uh, 2D example for doing reachability analysis. Uh, are there any questions for how we walked through that? Okay, and so we did this in position and velocity, but this can be defined in, in the entire state space of the system. And, you know, the, the too long didn't read uh, version of this is that we've, we've encoded the safety constraint into the construction of this safety value function and then apply dynamic programming to it in order to recover the value function. So we took this, what we call this hamilton jacobi variational inequality. And the key part of it is that the PDE here that we use to update the value function must be greater than or equal to zero between, because the min between these two equals zero. That means that under the optimal control policy here, we're saying that by chain rule, this, this whole phrase is just V dot, the change in velocity over time, that must be greater than or equal to zero. So my change in value with respect to time, and then the change in value with respect to space, and then space with respect to time, all of that must be greater than or equal to zero. So the safety level can never become, or the change in the safety level can never be non-negative, or can never be negative. Uh, it must always be non-negative. So you must always stay at the same safety level or recover more safety. And that's how we've encoded the safety constraint into the construction of the safety value function. So V dot is greater than or equal to zero for all time under the optimal control policy that we're recovering because again, we're just doing brute force dynamic programming here. So that's how we constructed it offline. And then online now we have this function that we've hand tuned for our particular control bounds, disturbance bounds, et cetera. And we use it online for a safe control. Now, one caveat here, I'm saying that I'm uh, applying this, this control in such a way that my safety level must always stay the same or become greater. And this can be kind of absurdly uh, conservative. So here's a setup that I have here where I have a goal, I have an obstacle and I have an initial condition. Here I'm showing what the value function looks like over that obstacle, where when the value function is positive, that corresponds to a positive safety. And when the value function is negative, that corresponds to, uh, to initial states from which I could hit the obstacle. And here I'm showing that zero boundary, uh, of the zero level set. So if I were to start inside of this, I may end up hitting this obstacle. It has this particular shape because in this case, I'm looking at a 3D Dubin's car. So I have my X position, I have my Y position, and then I have my orientation. And right now I'm plotting the orientation for this point, which is pointed to the right. So if I started right here, pointed to the right towards the obstacle, I could hit the obstacle before I could turn away. And if I start outside of this set, then I should be able to move around the obstacle and reach my goal. However, if I just look at the gradients of this function and apply my safe control directly based on the gradients to always run away uh, to higher and higher values of safety, then that means that we care nothing about performance. And instead, we uh, never allow ourselves to get close to the safety boundary, an S unless it's inevitable. And you end up seeing an effect like this, where we just try to run away from the obstacle and go as far away as possible. And so th this is the, the control signal over time. This is the trajectory over time. And you see that as we move, you know, we're, we're not even considering the performance control. So clearly it's, it doesn't make sense to apply the safety control at all times. Instead, in reachability analysis, we typically apply the safety controller um, only when necessary. And so in the extreme, you do something called a, a least restrictive control law, which is saying, switch to the safety controller only when you're too close to the boundary of the safe set. So looking at that, I'm going to go ahead and run this again, but now I'm only going to switch from the performance control to the safe control when I hit this boundary. And so you see that we actually are able to reach the goal in this case. As we're turning and moving towards it, I'm, I'm plotting the orientation. So you see how the, the set rotates. And then here we kind of bounce on and off the safety value function until we end up hitting our goal. <laughs>
So this, this works and we end up getting to our goal while avoiding the obstacles. Uh, the problem is practically this can be kind of painful because this is what the control signal looks for that, like for that. So here, if I'm doing this hard switch between my performance control and my safety control, then we end up with this chattering as I'm bouncing off the boundary of the safe set. So we get these undesirable jerky behaviors and they can also be prone to errors in the numerically computed gradient. So in practice, what we typically do is something sort of in between these two, we do some sort of weighted averaging type thing where as you approach the boundary of the safe set, you start weighting the safety controller more. Uh, but typically this is done in kind of a heuristic way, not really discussed very much in, in the papers. So the advantages and disadvantages of this technique. The advantage is that it's constructive and, and general. So, you know, we are doing dynamic programming so we can set up whatever our cost function is and kind of actually work backwards in time to determine, given our control constraints, our disturbance constraints, et cetera, what guarantees can we make? Uh, it can also deal again with bounded controls and disturbances because we encode them directly in the construction. And there's many flavors beyond infinite time safety. So we talked about reach, reach avoid, we can handle moving goals and obstacles as long as you know exactly how they will move ahead of time when you're doing your dynamic programming. And oh, this, and we also can recover the maximal safe set. So here's just a, a little example I, I pulled together here where I have a goal and then I actually have a moving obstacle. And we can encode these together into one value function where as the obstacle's moving, it slices through my value function. And the result that we end up with is something called a reach avoid set. So the set of states for which I'm guaranteed to reach my goal while avoiding this moving obstacle during the entire time. The requirement is that I needed to know how that obstacle was going to move. I could have a bunch of different obstacles. I could have my goal moving around everywhere. It would all be the same um, in terms of computation cost. But again, I would need to know ahead of time exactly how all that was going to go down. So the disadvantages. Uh, the, this online deployment of the value function is not too straightforward. In one extreme, we have that it's just conservative. In the other extreme, we have that it's, it's jerky. And so we do some sort of weighting of the two, usually. And then the big challenge is that we're doing dynamic programming, that we have the curse of dimensionality with this. This means that because we're updating every point in the state space by those equations that we talked about, that means I'm taking my state space, I'm discretizing it over a grid. And typically we're not even smart enough to do clever adapt adaptive gridding. We're doing a uniform grid and we're updating each point in that state space at each instant in time as we build this up backwards in time. That means for every additional state dimension that you have, you have exponentially more grid points to reason over. Because of this, you end up doing very simplistic versions of safety analysis. So you might take a quadcopter and instead you're doing you know, an analysis over a little 2D point mass or you're supposed to be looking at a human body and instead you assume that human bodies are just double inverted pendulums which you know, may not capture all the dynamics of a human body and therefore an analysis over the simpler model may not correspond to analysis over the higher dimensional system. So in terms of direct implementation, I think that the, the, the best toolboxes we have right now are only looking at uh, like five to six dimensional systems. So a lot of my work is on this challenge of the curse of dimensionality. Uh, and normally I would be talking about this. Uh, so just a, a little teaser. I do things like a system decomposition, trying to rip apart systems in uh, exact or approximate ways such that we can do analyses on each subsystem and kind of smush them back together. Uh, doing reduced order mo models where you have guarantees on the relationship between the lower order model that you're going to use for planning and the higher order system that uh, you want to maintain safety with respect to. Um, so I have this algorithm called fast track or fast or and safe tracking for that. And now we've been looking into doing warm starting of these reachability analyses to update safety efficiently. So if you've computed a value function, you find out that your assumptions on control bounds, disturbances, the obstacles are wrong. Can you update the previous analysis uh, quickly while maintaining guarantees 
rather than having to restart the computation entirely. And we found that uh, we, can, we can do that. In some cases, we can do it in a conservative way. And in some cases, we can do it in an exact way. And, and these have helped uh, a lot. So here's a recent ICRA paper um, that was showed up last summer where we had this 10 dimensional nonlinear quadcopter model. And by doing decomposition to it, we were able to compute it in the order of hours, the, the safety analysis. Uh, here in blue is the first uh, computation. And then in purple is when we updated the computation based on new information as we were gathering. Clearly this still isn't very useful to use online. But if we do decomposition plus this warm starting where we use the previous initialization, well, then it's still very costly to do the first computation, but then updating the computation based on new information takes less time. And if we do both of those plus adaptive gridding, then we're able to uh, greatly reduce the time for the initial computation and then the following computation. So we're finally getting to the point where this was somewhat practical to use online in a safe learning type of way, where we learn new information about the environment and then we updated our safety analysis for this 10D nonlinear quadcopter model based on that. So we made improvements. That's, that's my goal of this slide is just, we made improvements to the course of dimensionality issue, but it's still something that is always a thorn in our sides when it comes to this method. Okay, with that, I'm going to start shifting into talking about control barrier functions, unless I have uh, questions from the audience. I have a question about uh, your, the trade-off you talked about between the conservativeness and the noisiness. The jerkiness. Uh, mm. Why does it default to conservativeness? I'm not clear on that. Uh, because if you are using the gradients of the value function directly for your control at all times, the value function, all I encoded into it in this case was how to avoid the obstacle. I see. So the value function itself for this particular setup, it has no knowledge of where the goal is. It only encodes how you would avoid hitting the obstacle. And so if you're looking at the value function, the gradients, the gradients are pointing in the direction away from the obstacle. And if you always align your system along those gradients and apply the safety controller directly, then you will only end up taking you know, conservative actions that get you further and further away from the obstacle. Right, that makes sense. So isn't there, is there like a non, so we have to choose our threshold. Isn't there like a non-choice way of combining both the, what I want to get to and what I want to avoid? Great. Yes, I, 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 that's absolutely correct. I mean, the, the naive, simple thing to do is the least restrictive control that I mentioned, where you just do this hard switch between the two. In practice, uh, often what you see uh, when people are actually implementing this is some sort of weighting between the two, where if I'm far away from the obstacle, I use my performance control. As I get close to the obstacle, I use my um, safety control. And then in between, I do some sort of weighting. Now, this is usually done in somewhat of a heuristic type way, uh, but actually there was some, some work uh, recently coming out of Marco Pavone's lab uh, by Karen Lung, who's about to start at University of Washington and Mo Chen, who's now a professor at Simon Fraser, where they looked at uh, always taking the best performance control subject to the gradient of your safety being uh, uh, not being negative. So subject to staying within the kind of cone of safe constraints. So there are clever things that you can do there, but in general reachability now, the community just hasn't looked into this all that much. They typically just apply some sort of heuristic type weighting. But I, I think your intuition is right on that we could pretty easily come up with a, a technique for cleverly balancing these two. And that, in fact, is what control barrier functions they have done in their community. Cool. Thanks a lot. That was very clear. Yeah, sure. Uh, any other questions? OK, great. So let's talk about control barrier functions. Uh, control barrier functions are based off of this Nagumo's invariance principle. Um, so this idea that if you have some trajectory over your system and it moves over time, uh, the, the value of that trajectory can decrease over here, but in such a way that as it approaches the boundary of this, uh, this set, it must be uh, non-negative. So you're allowed to decrease while you're inside of the safe set, but as you approach the boundary, you cannot. 
And this is what control barrier functions are, are, are focused on. So here we have a B, this control barrier function. And it's a continuously differential full function whose zero super level set is the constraint set that we have here. And it's, it's set up such that the set of states such that the, the B is greater than or equal to zero is your safe set. So again, it corresponds to a positive value being corresponding to a positive safety level. And for, for all values of B that are not zero, that, that you're able to stay within uh, this safe set. And this is by looking at this positive coefficient gamma, such that for all points with inside this constraint set, if you apply uh, the control that maximizes along the gradients of this uh, value function, you will always be greater than or equal to minus gamma B. So this is the, the key difference between reachability analysis and control barrier functions. We were saying that we wanna make sure that the change in value over time is always greater than or equal to zero. Here, this is saying that the safety value uh, must be greater than or equal to minus gamma B. And we'll talk about the, what that means and why it's significant in a second. So if these two things are satisfied, if it's greater than or equal to zero when it's inside of the system, if it's continuously differentiable, and if we're able to maintain this guarantee, then B is a controlled barrier function. And any Lipschitz continuous control law that satisfies the above constraint will render the set C safe, i.e. control invariant. So what this is saying, this constraint here, is that if you start off at a high level of safety, at some positive level of safety, you can actually decrease your level of safety over time, as long as it is lower bounded by this minus gamma B. So when B is very positive, then you can actually decrease your safety by quite a bit by this negative number. As B approaches zero, so as you approach the boundary of the safe set, then you end up recovering that B dot must be greater than or equal to zero. So as this number goes down to zero. So this is saying when you're far away from the obstacle, you can decrease your safety level. And as you get closer and closer to the obstacle, you must obey that safety constraint more and more. So this kind of naturally embeds that averaging weighting thing that uh, Sahil is mentioning would be clever to do online. And that's the kind of key, uh, I think most interesting difference between these two. Uh, we'll also talk about some of the other uh, uh, minor differences such as this continuous differentiability requirement. So again, the key part is that the change in safety over time uh, must be greater than or equal to minus gamma B. So first offline, how do you find or construct this particular value safety value function? We're actually going to skip this for now. So let's assume that we just have a valid one that we're given it somehow. And we're gonna talk about how we use this online for safe control. So the control barrier function community has uh, developed a optimization program for doing this. And uh, it's actually a QP that's very easy to solve online if you have a control affine system. And the setup is, is quite simple. It's just saying, you know, you're trying to minimize the difference between your control and some reference controller, your performance control, let's say, subject to the, the CBF constraint that the change in your safety value must be greater than or equal to that minus gamma B and subject to your input constraint. So this means that you know, your objective is just to follow the, the optimal control for the, the performance controller or whatever performance control you have, but you're required to satisfy this constraint that says, as you get closer and closer to the boundary of the safe set, and as this B becomes less and less positive, you need to enforce that you start moving in the direction of safer, uh, safer movement. So kind of looking at the relationship between the, the previous techniques that we talked about in this one. So we discussed using the safe control only where you only ever try to move in the direction of non-negative uh, safety. We talked about the least restrictive control one which got us to our goal but had this chattering effect as we were switching between the two. And then we had the CBF QP that where the CBF constraint becomes stronger and stronger as you approach the boundary of the safe set. And this is the effect you see here. 
So you see a very similar trajectory as what we saw here, but with a much smoother uh, control signal. Because again, this is essentially naturally encoding in that weighting between using the performance control and using that safety control. So this is a really nice aspect about using CVFs uh, that typically they're, they're very nice to use in practical cases and online. But as, as Sahil was mentioning, there's not really a, a reason why we shouldn't be doing this in reachability. So again, looking at the relationship between the two can help highlight you know, important things that we should be stealing from each other's fields. Okay, so we talked about how, how they use this online for safe control, but how did we actually get that control barrier function in the first place? So how did we do the offline thing of, of finding a, a barrier function that satisfies the safety constraint, the control bounds, et cetera. And this is where the issue is in the control barrier function community. There's, there's no general constructive method that exists currently. And so the ways in which we try to find a, a valid control barrier function is that for certain system dynamics, there are kind of known forms of acceptable control barrier functions. So you can do sort of a, a guess and check type thing where you define a control barrier function for a system and then check that it satisfies these conditions. Or you can use different techniques to, to search for a valid control barrier function. So some of squares optimization techniques, uh, there's a lot of work right now doing neural network based function approximation where you sample a bunch of points, fit a function to it, and then check to see if that function satisfies uh, along a bunch of sample points, usually sampling around the boundary of the safe area and then finding counterexamples and then using that to again train your system or doing the hand tune guess and check so often you know if you find just a you know fairly conservative smooth looking function uh, then it may work just naturally by checking it or sometimes people will just use one and assume that it'll work pretty well without actually having any formal guarantees on them so the advantages of control barrier functions is, is really in the online controller. It really nicely trades off between the performance and the safety controller. One other kind of, kind of nuanced advantage is that it's not trying to find the maximal safe set. It's not trying to find the best function that represents the, the biggest safe set. Often they use simpler functions that are that are more conservative, but also perhaps more intuitive and easy to use. So for example, maybe just define just in position space instead of position and velocity, or for you know, some higher dimensional system just defined in a subspace of this. As kind of a cartoon example of, of what I mean, if we have position and velocity and we need to stay inside this constraint set, let's say that using reachability, we recover this shape. As, as the set of states that I must start in such that I, I won't exit this constraint set. And so we have this value function that's defined in 2D. It has these like weird kink points. And in general, you need to be thinking in both position and velocity when you're looking at your control. If instead I just define my value function position space and recovered a subset of this that said, if I stay inside this orange set, I I'm, can stay safe then you could just define your control barrier function in, in 1D that's just in position and have this just kind of nice, simple, smooth curve that you're using for your safety control. And so often practically uh, control barrier functions can be uh, easier to think about and simpler to use and define because you're guessing functions like this and then checking to make sure that they satisfy your safety constraints. They may again be more conservative and recover less of the space uh, but it may be easier to work with practically. The disadvantages is that there's no general constructive method. So again, there's, the, there's a lot of challenge in finding a control barrier function that satisfies these. And especially when you add in things like control bounds and disturbance bounds, having to find a function that satisfies all of these possible things can be very challenging. And so often you have a function that online, when you're using this QP, may not be guaranteed to be feasible everywhere. You typically recover a subset of the maximal safe set. And this is because of two key reasons. One is that you're not doing dynamic programming. So you know the, this guess and check type of method looks only for valid control barrier functions, not necessarily the, the best one. 
And the second thing is this requirement from the community that the function is differentiable everywhere. So here, you know, this, this function that I had had these kind of key kinky points of non-differentiability potentially. And the reachability community is, is actually fine with points of non-differentiability. So, so intuitively, if you think about being in that bike that I was showing and going straight at that tree, there's this bifurcation that happens where on one side, it's better to turn left around the tree and on the other side, it's better to turn right around the tree. And so you end up with this kink in the value function. Practically, uh, you're, you typically take either or if they're equally likely. Uh, and also practically, you're typically not exactly on that boundary where the optimal control is technically undefined. Uh, and so we use viscosity solutions and sub and super gradients in order to get around this with reachability. In the control barrier function community, they, they aren't interested in, in viscosity solutions as of right now, and, and so require that the function itself is continuously differentiable. This means that the control policy must be Lipschitz continuous across the state space. So you can't ever have a point at which on one side uh, you would turn left and on the other side you would turn right. Instead, you're doing things like always turning right around obstacles. Uh, or shifting how you would turn in a smooth way rather than having these points of non-differentiability. And because of that, because of that requirement, you can't recover as much of the safe space. And that was a very nuanced point. If it didn't make sense, don't, don't worry about it. And then it's typically hard to encode these control bounds and disturbance bounds and et cetera. So that's uh, kind of the pros and cons of using control barrier functions. Are there any questions about this? Okay, I know I'm running low on time, so I'll just show quickly our, our method of smushing them together and then we can go into some discussion. Okay, so here are again the, the pros and cons between the reachability and CBFs. I, I won't go over them again, but our, our goal here is to find a way of being able to take the advantages and put them together. So the, the really the key difference was this thing of the, the safety constraint, how we encoded the safety constraint differently. So in reachability, we said that the change in value, the change in safety must be non-negative. And in CBFs, they're saying the change in value can be negative sometimes, but must obey this relationship between uh, the, the, val the current value of safety as it goes to zero, uh, maintaining that it's uh, our, we're upper or lower bounding our safety analysis by this. And so we asked, you know, simply, can we take this constraint and throw it into this encoding? So let's introduce this maximal decay rate, this gamma term, into the reachability formulation. And we did that in a very simple way. So we took our uh, Hamilton Jacobi variational inequality, this equation, and we simply added a plus gamma b right here. So this is saying, you know, knowing that this term is B dot, this is saying B dot plus gamma B must be greater than or equal to zero. So B dot plus gamma B must be greater than or equal to zero for all disturbances inside of D and for all time under the optimal control policy. So we simply just changed the, the safety constraint that we're encoding from being something that's greater than or equal to zero directly to something that's greater than or equal to this minus gamma b. So we actually just, as we're updating the system using dynamic programming, use this more, this different safety constraint in the construction. The resulting value function looks like this. It's very similar to the value function that we had before from reachability analysis, except with this um, exponential term here. And when we, use that when we simply change the constraint that we're using in the constr construction of the reachability analysis, we end up with something that we're calling a CBVF. We're not calling it a CBF uh, because we can still have points of non-differentiability. And so technically it is not a CBF, but uh, for all intents and purposes, it essentially is a CBF. And because we're using dynamic programming for this, it's constructive and general and recovers the maximal safe set. And we can encode, again, bounded control and disturbances. On the CBF side, we can now take in the, the QP formulation and use that online. So here's the uh, robust CBF QP, which is simply the same thing as the, the QP that we looked at from the CBF community. 
where the, the examples that I showed you before, here, this is actually using uh, a CBVF, one of the ones that we've actually hand encoded and using the QP online for that. So we see that it works well. The robust CBF QP gives the optimal control signal no matter what reference is being used and can satisfy control and disturbance constraints that are built in to the value function and can be used directly as a safety filter. So we don't have to use least restrictive switching control. So we get this aspect. And then in terms of future work, the directions that we wanna continue pushing on, well, we wanna pull from reachability this fact that we can have these many flavors beyond infinite time safety. So reach, reach, avoid, moving goals and obstacles. And we're just starting to explore that. And one way we're exploring it is by looking at finite time safety. So for infinite time, we can end up with stuff that can be fairly conservative. So let's say if I start here and I want to reach this goal and I have two obstacles here, this is the value functions according to both obstacles uh, together. If I'm trying to stay safe for an infinite time, I can never reach this goal uh, because as I approach the boundary here, if I were to hit this goal, eventually I may end up crashing into this obstacle. And so it never allows me to approach the goal. If I don't care about that, if I just care about reaching the goal, and then let's say I'm a hybrid system that will switch into a different state space. So it doesn't matter if I'll end up hitting an obstacle after I reach the goal. Then you only care about finite time safety. You only care about reaching the goal, and then the world disappears and you don't have to worry about hitting an obstacle after that. In that case, the analysis allows us to reach the goal, and you see that the safe set shrinks over time as we approach the goal. So if, I think this is gonna be really interesting for hybrid systems. So uh, Koshal, uh, my collaborator works on, on walking robots where once you reach your goal state, you switch into a different state space. We're also looking a little bit at the kind of reach version of a CBF, which would be a CLF, a control Lyapunov function, where instead of reachability, where you're trying to reach a goal in the minimum amount of time, and not necessarily staying at the goal and stabilizing there, can we modify our analysis for reachability to instead provide something that's more like a control Lyapunov function, where we are reaching the goal in such a way that as we enter the goal, we can stay inside of the goal in a stable sense. And then the other thing that we're trying to, to look at is by taking inspiration from the CBF community that use these kind of simpler, more easy to use uh, techniques for coming up with functions that are not necessarily the best functions, but are easier to use and easier to find, can we help try to reduce the issues of cursive dimensionality? And so here we're interested in looking at safe learning with control barrier functions to take advantage of tools for approximating high dimensional safety functions from the CBF community and to take advantage of the tools I was mentioning for dealing with the cursive dimensionality from the reachability community and combining them together. So looking at you know, taking some initial knowledge and assumptions, initializing some high dimensional approximation from CBFs, apply reachability tools selectively to update this to something more rigorous, get more information online and update and repeat. Uh, I'm also having a collaboration with Professor Sean Gao in computer science. Where we're doing a similar thing of trying to uh, generalize control barrier functions for multi-agent interactions. Uh, since we're low on time, I won't go into that for right now. But okay, so that's our introduction of the CBVF and our analysis of the reachability in C CBF. Uh, and I would like to thank again my collaborators for this particular project, as well as the, the students and collaborators who are working on these kind of next step approaches. Please let me know if you have questions, ideas, complaints, et cetera. My email is very simple. It's sherbert, as herbert at ucsd.edu. And with that, I will finish. Thank you so much. Thank you, Silvia, for the talk. Um, let's open the stage for questions. Is there any question from the audience? Yeah, thank you, Silvia, very much. Sorry, um, I was late at the beginning of your talk. Uh, I have the kids at home, the, the school is closed now. Okay. So um, anyway, uh, <clears throat> yeah, it's very, very interesting. Uh, and you know, clearly, I'm familiar with a, with a lot of this work. Um, mm -hmm. Now, 
one thing that I wonder if you've ever thought about is, so you're, we're talking about barrier functions, right? So barrier functions um, in this context really are meant to keep the system within some safe set, right? Now, what if something happens and the system finds itself outside of that safe set? What happens? Or oh, better yeah. off, blue screen of death and, uh, <laughs> you know, just say question. your prayers and that's it? Or, yeah. or do something else? So, so this is actually something that I really love about the CBF community is that uh, I think I think it's Aaron Ames who has a paper showing that when you are outside of the safe set, the CBF acts as a CLF. So if you apply the same exact constraints and you're outside of the safe set, you, I mean, you can just think of it as like flipping this upside down essentially. And now the this gamma, this maximum decay rate becomes the lambda that you see in CLFs. And so CBFs actually have this nice property where when you're in the unsafe set, you have this, depending on the structure of, of the system, you have this stabilization that happens as it brings it back into the safety set. If, if the CBF is a valid one that is actually defined over the whole state space. And so in general, I think that that's a, an interesting aspect of the CBF community that we don't really look at in reachability. We haven't really thought very much about safe recovery once you've entered an unsafe area. And so I'm interested in seeing, first off, do we naturally have that effect in these reachability-based value functions? I don't think we've even analyzed that yet. And second off, if not, can we figure out how to you know, take the, the concepts and the theory from the CBF community and use that in reachability analysis so that that one value function not only encodes how to stay inside the safety, a safe set, but also how to recover back into it when you're outside. So, so in your case, because I'm thinking of barrier functions in optimization, typically they're not even defined outside the physical set, right? Uh, so these are functions that, that go to infinity, right? So, uh, so you're thinking of control barrier function as something that doesn't necessarily. So it could be defined outside of the safe set. Right, yes, right? And, and you're right. I guess the original barrier functions were, were zero barrier functions where there's zero outside. But if it, if it continues to be defined in the negative value space, then you end up mm. with a CLF so, effect so, outside. Okay, so, so in a sense, you're thinking of the safe set as some sort of a level set in something that looks like a control Yapno function. Yes, and the only difference would be how you how you treat the, you know, when you're inside of the safe set, you're not necessarily trying to stabilize to a point that's as deep as possible in the safe set. You know, you treat right, the, right, right, right. but when you're outside, you are trying to to do that. Right, right. And you know, for me, it's a little bit of philosophical thing, right? So because as you said, you know, once you're inside the safe set, you don't really care about, you know, as long as you're safe, you know, just do your things. Yeah, <laughs> and that. But what you do care about is if you end up being unsafe for whatever reason, right? And maybe unsafe is not necessarily already dead, right? So <laughs> mm -hmm. th there is something that you can do. So in a sense, you know, wouldn't it be more interesting to to work on? Okay, I am unsafe. What's the least worst thing that I can do? Right, while staying yeah. outside of the safe set, right? Absolutely, and I, I think that this recovery, right? Yes, I think I think that your intuition's right on in the direction that we need to be moving into, where we go beyond hard safety guarantees and look. Maybe maybe there are some hard safety guarantees where you do want to encode some things like that, but then within that you have like softer uh, safety issues where you need to learn how when you uh, you know disobey these, how you can recover in a nice way. I, I think that we absolutely need to be considering both and and typically in, in the controls community, we kind of have this very finite, like either you've touched an obstacle and you're dead or oh, right, you're- Right, right, so you see, but you know, this is, uh, okay. So a lot of the work, this work started, you know, by looking at those, that kind right. of question, right? Um, but now I'm wondering, and, but then, you know, the reality is that when you set these safety constraints, you are very conservative, right? Because yep. because you want it, right? Mm -hmm. But then if you're very conservative, then there are some things that even if, if you violate that safety con constraint, you're not 
really yeah. that unsafe, right? So you can still do things. So Absolutely. I think I know this is kind of interesting, you know, because so how to manage unsafety in a sense, you know, so how to avoid, you know, I always think of the, you know, if you're running Windows, something unsafe happens, blue screen of death, you power cycle the computer and start again, right? Mm -hmm. On a car or an airplane, you cannot do that, right? So how do you manage potential unsafe conditions in a systematic way? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And how you deal with with potential failures and even even looking at changing how we define safety. So you, with an airplane, which all this is based off of originally thinking about, sure, you don't ever want to intersect with an obstacle. But I was watching a video um, analyzing how bees fly and bees have very, very simple control policies and they just bump off of blades of grass and things all the time and recover and, and keep moving. And so also based on the, the form factor of your system, you may have different notions of what is safe and isn't safe and how do you change your analysis when you're a bee to be able to use you know, a much, much simpler policy online because you know that you can recover safely. And how do you do that recover safely or, or, and even plan for that type of bouncing behavior? Uh, I think these are all really interesting questions. One of my students is, is looking into a safety for surgical robots and their, it, challenges all these typical definitions of safety where now you are directly intersecting with an obstacle and trying to reason about what is safe when you're doing that. So I, I, it's very exciting and, and, and a fun direction to be moving in. I, I totally agree that this is where we need to be thinking. Thank, thank you, Sima. And uh, yeah, I, I just want to give some time to other people to ask questions. I don't want to talk all the time. Thank you. Is there any other question? So maybe it's because you have to. Oh yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, Truls, right? Yes. Uh, thank go you ahead. for a great presentation. I had a question just on uh, the slide where you compared the, the three uh, different uh, control policies. Uh, it looked like you had some kind of uh, uh, like uh, time to to reach the goal there. Uh, could you go back to that slide? Yeah, sure. On a couple of slides ago. Oops. Sorry, one second. I was just wondering, like, because my intuition would be that the, the switching in jerky behavior would be faster, even though it would be uh, jerky. Yeah. yeah. But it looked like uh, actually the, the CVBF was. Uh, actually, I don't remember which one. So, yeah, let's find out together. Uh, so, um, let's see, this one took 0.95 seconds and this one took 0.94. Oh, it did end up taking less time. I yeah, think. So you have often, often you're right that the least restrictive one does end up uh, being faster, um, but sometimes the smoothing effect does end up helping. All right. Um, so, uh, but, but do you have any intuition to why? Because in my head, it would be uh, the the least restrictive one should be kind of optimal in some sense. But, uh, I think it has to do with the the specifics of this exact setup. So the fact that the the goal is behind this obstacle here means that here the, the performance control was taking a more direct beeline for the goal and then had to deviate more around the obstacle. Whereas here, you see that it started turning away from the obstacle more, more quickly. And that happens to be because of the radius of this obstacle, the, the faster path to get to the goal. So I think it's just based on the very specific setup that we have here in this one. I think on average, you will see, especially when you don't have an obstacle right in the path between you and the goal when the obstacle is more you know somewhere down here where you might bounce off of it once you will typically see least restrictive control being uh, a more direct route i think uh, but again in in practice we tend to care so much more about not having this like ridiculous bang bang type of effect that uh we we prefer something that might take a couple seconds longer but you aren't uh, stressing out your motors too much all right, great. Yeah, thanks. So I guess that's, uh, I mean, the, the CBF, uh, it doesn't have any sort of like an MPC that has like an horizon that it optimizes. So it only optimizes. No, it doesn't. It doesn't itself have an MPC type thing. You can, there's a lot of work on trying to encode CBF constraints into um, model predictive control things for for the time horizon thing. Similarly with reachability, you sometimes see that happening. So you can add all those bells and whistles if you want, but the just straight up 
CBFQP is just this weighting between uh, the performance control and the safety control. All right, thank you very much. Yeah, sure. And then, and similarly to your point, um, the CBF community typically doesn't look at reach avoid cases where they're looking at one holistic function that will get you to the goal while avoiding the obstacle. Whereas in reachability, I could have, if I knew where this goal was ahead of time, I could have created one unified uh, uh, value function that would tell me how to reach this goal while avoiding the obstacle and would actually give me the optimal path for doing that. Uh, so like one value function whose gradient tells you how to do both in one. And that is the, the best setup. Like you, we will have the minimum time shortest path for doing that because we're dynamic programming it. But in general, you don't know where your goals might be relative to where your obstacles are. And so often people separate out the performance uh, based control or value function and the safety based one so that you can kind of use them selectively online. Right. Oh. Um, I think we're a bit over time, but there is a question. Oh, yeah, there is a question. Maybe we can, let's see, maybe we can get it in. Okay. Uh, um, why not? Do you want to read it out? Yeah. Okay. So way out of my depth here, but as you say, hard safety is rare. So why not leave the weighting open in the sense of open systems such that whatever outer system costs can be incorporated? So if the drone breaks, there's a finite cost to the lab to get a new one. And that could be incorporated as a smoothish finite cost rather than an infinite cost. Interesting. So yeah, somehow uh, add in like soft constraints into here that incorporate the fact that, you know, you, you could take that more risky behavior, but it might end up with this cost of needing to buy a new drone for the lab. And so then you would need to add in that extra cost. Uh, I, I've never thought about doing that, but that's an, that's an interesting idea. <laughs> and I like, I like that way of thinking, uh, but no, I have, I haven't explored that. <laughs> cool. Thanks. Yeah, sure. Great. Thank you all for the great question and great discussion. Thank you again, Sylvia, for, for the time and for the talk. Uh, yes, good luck so for much. the next steps. Yeah. And thank uh, you. I appreciate it. I'm sure you can reach out to Sylvia in case you want to have further discussions, uh, you gave your email before. Yes, cool. Sherbert at ucsd.edu. Perfect. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you all. And see you all next week for the next autonomy talk. Bye-bye. Okay.